This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Hello, I'm Michael Burke. Welcome to a brand new series of Royal Recipes. This time, we're at Western Burt House, formerly a grand country house, now a boarding school, which has played host to royal visitors for over a hundred years. In this series, we're delving even further back in time to reveal over 600 years of royal food heritage. You play Anne Boleyn, <laughs> and I will play Henry VIII. And we've been busy unlocking the secrets of Britain's great food archives, discovering rare and unseen recipes that have been royal favourites through the ages. From the earliest royal cookbook in 1390... It's so precious, so special, that I'm not allowed to touch it. ..to Tudor treats from the court of Henry VIII. I can't wait for this. <laughs> One, two, three. We'll be exploring the great culinary traditions enjoyed by the royal family, from the grand to the groundbreaking, as well as the surprisingly simple. I did think that was going to be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> as we hear from a host of royal chefs. Prince Philip would walk past or pop his head in and say, what's for dinner, what are we having? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's not just a normal kitchen. And meet the people who provide for the royal table. It's OK for the Queen, it's OK for everyone. Welcome to Royal Recipes. We're looking at the Royals' love of sport today and the food that they eat when they're at it. This time on Royal Recipes... So that's quite a powerful taste. Quite a powerful taste. Chef Paul Ainsworth scores with a Tudor hunting snack. Oh, what have I got in my saddlebag? Do you know <laughs> what? I wouldn't mind that in my saddlebag. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Dr Annie Gray gets a flavour of lunch aboard a royal racing yacht. It's a lovely little menu, actually, but it is very, very simple food. I know that George V was particularly fond, apparently, of mashed potatoes. And we make Olympian efforts to turn out a Buckingham Palace pud. <laughs> You've gone all red. <laughs> I'm here in the Royal Recipes kitchen, and with me today is Michelin starred chef Paul Ainsworth. This is looking really interesting. What are you doing today? Mitten of pork. It's a terrine, basically, but rather than in a terrine mould, it's going to be in this beautiful pudding basin, ideal for picnics. Picnics, and that's the point, because royal picnics in particular, this dish goes all the way back, maybe even beyond, to Henry VIII. It was his right, favourite. Okay. He was always outdoors, yeah. always riding, hunting. This was the sort of thing that would be in Henry VIII's saddlebag, and it's still a favourite with the royal family today. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. We've got unrivaled access to the world's leading historians, with hundreds of documentaries featuring everything from Boudicca to the British royal family. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and real royalty fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use code REALROYALTY at checkout. The recipe is actually based on one we found in this wonderful old cookbook that's hidden away in the British Library called Country Contentments or the English Housewife. Absolutely. So what we've got here is, look at this, a lattice of bacon. That isn't is that ingenious, impressive? isn't it? Yeah. Is it, it it's kind yeah, of plated? It completely plated, right plated the way bacon. through. Look at yep. that. Now, tell me, how long did it take you to plat the... Uh, well, while you were the... having a massage this morning, <laughs> I was here pressing on with this. Yep. That's going to season the mixture in the middle, which is, we come over to here, pork loin. Oh, this it's is... the equivalent of a fillet steak in beef, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. If you just kind of feel it, it's such a tender cut. It that really the slides just glides through. through it. And when you're cooking um, tenderloin of pork, I remember we were always told that the one meat that you shouldn't have rare, you shouldn't have red, is pork. We now treat, for me, pigs exactly like we would a piece of beef. Now, I wouldn't cook this medium rare, but I would cook it pink like a blushing piece of saddle of lamb. And, and treat it like any other meat? Huh? Absolutely. OK, so what are you putting in there now? So what I've got here is some sausage meat. Yeah. Now, just now, have what's a smell this? of that. 
Oh, what'd you get? Well, I'd say, I'm not good on these things, but almost nutmeg, but not quite. Absolutely spot what on. What is it then? That is mace. Mace. Okay. I've heard of mace, but it's a rather more old-fashioned really? ingredient, is it? Do you use it in your kitchen? We do. We use it a lot. It's an amazing ingredient. It's the husk. It's the outside of the nutmeg. Oh. Now, what we've done, Michael, is we've just literally cooked the, the onions down with some mace and some sage and butter. All these ingredients right here are still absolutely relevant today. This is real Sunday roast territory for mm. me. Mm. Pork, sage, onions. Mm. You can just imagine, can't you? There's Henry on his horse. You know, ready to go off hunting, and the servant coming out with uh, with this, with this amazing mitten, yeah. mitten of pork, mitten. and him putting it in his saddlebags. You know, we get Henry VIII completely wrong. We've got this idea of him, you know, full of dropsy, fat, you know, and all. Which is exactly how I think of him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But for most of his life, he was incredibly tall, athletic. Now they say <laughs> actually uh, that he spent a third of his life in the saddle, hunting, right. jousting. Yeah. Okay, Paul, what are you doing now? You're layering. I'm it. layering. You've, so you've I've put done. this. You've mixed absolutely the sausage meat and the other ingredients. Yeah. You put a layer of that in. You're putting a layer of pork tenderloin so that it's in stories inside. Absolutely. Yep. And what's going to happen seasoning is it, seasoning. It. That is the key. Mm. Seasoning all the way. The dish goes back to Tudor times, but it's actually named after a Regency rake called Mad Jack. Mitten. Mad Jack Mitten. And he really was an eccentric, to say the very least. He used to feed his dogs with champagne and fillet steak. Anyway, he's achieved immortality. Mitten of pork, named after him. Yeah, good on him. <laughs> I like that. So you come right up to the top. You want to get in as many layers as you can. And the more layers you get, the more impressive when we come to cut this. OK? The other image we have of Henry is of those banquets and him sitting there all fat and throwing chicken legs over his shoulder and things. But actually, apparently, he was a very fastidious eater. Didn't was actually he? throw many banquets at all, except on uh, special occasions. He was so fit and active until his 40s, and then he had, he had, a, he had a jousting absolutely. accident, yeah. got his leg injured, and it never healed. It got ulcerous, right. and his, his waist ballooned to 52 inches. Right, OK, now see, what's Look happening? at this. You've domed it. You, domed you, you know, it. Right, this. just flat. You've got a... And there's got a, a reason for this. Why? So when this cooks, mm -hmm. it's going to reduce. It's going to compact down a bit. Absolutely. Yeah. So we want to pack it to allow that reduction, yeah. because then we're going to press it when it comes out. Yeah. So that's now, if I can just give you this to take to the oven. Okay. Tin foil, buttered. Yeah. Right the way around, like so. We're now going to transfer this into the tray. Yeah. We're yep. going to cook it at 180 for 50 minutes. 50 minutes. Okay. The famous 180. The famous None 180. None of you cooks cook at anything else. Everything's at 180. Yep. Here we go. <laughs> But we don't have to wait, do we? No, we don't. Because we've got one already. Right. Let's have a look. Oh, what have I got in my saddlebag? Do you know <laughs> what? I wouldn't mind that in my saddlebag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is pretty impressive, isn't it? That looks fantastic. And you see, you've got that shape. It's cooked down and then yeah. we pressed it. So as soon as it comes out the oven, yeah. we press it yeah. overnight, yeah. let it set, then all of the juices will come out, a bit like a pork pie. Do you, you put know? it in the fridge? Do you make yeah. it cool? Yeah, put yep. it in the yep. fridge. Now, if you can see, I've then glazed it all over. You see that thing? With the juices that have come With out With the of it. juices yep. and that natural jelly. Yep. But I love the way the plating of the, the latticing, as you put it, yeah. of the bacon, makes it look so pro. Almost as if you were a professional chef. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and look how wonderfully chunky and solid it is. Are you ready? Yeah. Just pull them apart. <laughs> I mean, wow. what blows me away is, you know, for me, that right now is yeah. modern, relevant, incredible cookery. Yeah. And they were doing that all those years ago. How are you <laughs> going to serve it up? I am going to serve this to you on a plate with some beautiful pickle lily, a nice wedge and some salad herbs. Some sharpness there. Yes, absolutely. And that's exactly... We've got a lot of sort of protein and fat there, and that sharpness is going to be wonderful. Um, I don't want to be rude, but just looking at it, you sure the bacon on the outside is cooked? It looks pretty pale. Do you know me. what? It's an excellent question, Michael. And if you feel it, just have a feel on the outside. You'll feel how firm it is. You've oh, got yeah. to remember, it's in a terrine mould. It's just completely and utterly enclosed, so it hasn't got an open um, surface. So, to reassure you, it's cooked. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, and the pork <laughs> inside's quite pink. Yeah, and then, like we said earlier, yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. what's lovely. The sausage meat's lovely and firm, and then those little layers of pork are beautiful and pink. Tell you what, it's so, rich, though, isn't it? Oh, it's absolutely delicious. You can just imagine pulling up with your horse, couldn't you, and having, uh, taking this out your saddle <laughs> and a couple of plates. A little bit of olive oil on those herbs. How you managed to keep a slim waist when eating this sort of stuff, I And there know. we go. Look at that. Uh, there's yours. Thank you very much. Do you mind if I start? You go for it. I've been very patient. Ooh. But it's just nice. You've got the texture, you've got the lovely pickles, that lovely, lovely and chunky, isn't in the it? Yeah, absolutely mm. delicious. Lovely. The pickle in uh, Just everything, mm. isn't it? Absolutely You do delicious. need it, don't you? Mm. I'm going to have another of those. Happy? Mmm. More than that, yeah. ecstatic. Fantastic. Perfect for... Anything outdoors. It is, isn't it? It's that proper outdoor fodder. Absolutely. <laughs> Royal or otherwise. Yes. A fortifying hunting snack for England's most famous king. But of course, a regal love of the outdoor life didn't start or stop with Henry VIII. George V, grandfather to the current queen, was also a keen sportsman. He was known as the Sailor King and spent many happy times at a royal holiday spot, the Isle of Wight. Annie Gray weighs anchor. When it comes to sailing, Cow's Week is the dazzling place to see and be seen. But it got that way because of royal patronage. Between the wars, George V raced here many times. He had his own yacht, Britannia, a light, strong and successful racer, said to be one of the most beautiful yachts ever built. Sailing on the King's yacht in the 1930s must have been an exciting experience. Mary Montague Scott's grandmother, Pearl, wrote it all down in her diaries, giving us a valuable insight into the royal family at play. Pearl Montague was married to my grandfather, John, Lord Montague of Bewley and he was a friend of the royal family. She describes in great detail the, the, the sailing race of the day, who was on board, what they did, where they came in the race. So they're a fantastic record of Cow's Week in the 1930s of these incredible races. That's absolutely amazing. She said, the most thrilling day, we could hardly believe that we had won, till Astra cheered. This is the king's fourth win and two seconds in a week. He presented Mary Beaufort and I with lovely enamel brooches of his erasing flag. We were so thrilled. And this is the brooch of Britannia. Oh, of, isn't that Given gorgeous? by the king to my grandmother. Because every time she went on Britannia, they won. <laughs> and so we're very, very honored to still have this brooch. It's absolutely beautiful, isn't it? Does she talk about the dinners at all? She says, I changed into evening clothes. Harry sent me across to the Royal Yacht Victoria and Albert. Britannia was moored very close to the Victoria and Albert, the official yacht, where the royals and their guests would eat, drink and socialise after a busy day racing. A perfect evening and sunset. I sat on the King's left and Admiral Dudley North on my left. After a marvellous dinner, we went up on upper deck and watched the fireworks. The King pressed an electric button and up went the V&A's rockets and then all began. So even then, they had an electric button to start the fireworks. This is 1935, quite amazing. But the sense there of glamour and glitz and beauty really does come through, doesn't Absolutely. It? And as a woman, I think it's incredibly rare. I don't know of any other ladies who raced with the king during this time in Britannia. Good for Pearl. Yeah, very good. Socialising at mealtimes went hand in hand with the yachting life. But what was actually eaten on board? Dennis Steele is a maritime historian based in Cowes. Britannia was quite outstanding. She was, in a sense, the ultimate racing yacht of her era. She won her first race, and she won more than 200 following that, and she was placed in half of her 600 races. So this is one of the menus, is it, from the Britannia? This was from 1935, and it was quite clearly a racing menu rather than the more lavish ones that you would have had on the Victoria and Albert. Petit pois à la crème and purée de pommes de terre. I know that George V was particularly fond, apparently, of mashed potatoes. So mm. presumably this dish yes. of peas and mashed potatoes yes. was really something for him. Yes, indeed. And I suppose a pigeon pie as well. Again, you can chop a slice and then you yes. can have it perhaps yes. in a sort of couple of so minutes. So in a sense, to you, as an awful modern expression, it was food to go. It's a lovely little menu, actually. But it is very, very simple food. 
And the V&A 3 is the Victoria and Albert, isn't it? So that's the more, I suppose, more cruising yacht that he had? It was a very prestigious steam yacht. It was the third of three Victoria and Alberts, and it came into service in 1901. And, of course, we were at the peak of our power as an empire at that time, and she was the best around. In the evenings, they would all decamp to the Victoria they and would Albert. go on board the Victoria and Albert, which is 5,500 tonnes, with a fabulous dining room with a wonderful skylight. Uh, and, of course, we have to remember that all the crowned heads of Europe used to come to Cowes in those days. On board that ship, you've got a much bigger galley, presumably, and you have, much, you have a much bigger team of uh, chefs a, a working. A much bigger, bigger team. And, uh, again, by 1900, you've got refrigeration, so the standard of food is higher and it's much easier to preserve it. And what about the Queen? Did Queen Mary enjoy racing as well? Was she out there no, with George V? She, she, she uh, did not like racing at all, so the King would go racing and she'd go off in the, uh, in the Daimler and have a look around antique shops. The story of Britannia has a sad ending. George V wrote in his will that if none of his children wanted her, she was to be scuttled. So she was sunk upon his death in 1936. All that remains of the once great racing yacht are a few pieces of furniture and, of course, that wonderful lunch menu, a fitting inspiration for the Royal Recipes Kitchen. This is going to be Derby beef. Derby beef? Derby beef. What the French will call a pot au feu, all right? So, which is basically um, meat, vegetables, not roasted or cooked in a pot. So a one-pot wonder. Now, the great thing about it is the seasons can change with it. So you can have in the spring lots of peas, asparagus, broad beans. As you move into the autumn, lovely root vegetables. So we've got some lovely carrots, some beautiful turnips, smoked bacon, juniper, a wonderful buki garni, which we're going to tie up. Just have a smell of that at the time. Mm. Parsley, bay leaf, some red wine vinegar and some salt. So really simple, What but the French delicious. would call pot au feu, <laughs> what, what the English would call boiled beef and carrots, I suppose. Boiled beef and carrots. And what King George V called derby beef, there yeah. we are, that he served with ham, tongue, lamb and beef and pigeon pie on that yacht. Yes. On that fabulous racing yacht that was the yeah. love of his life. And this was the centrepiece. Now, what do you do? So, what we've got here is the silver side. So, it's not the most expensive cut. It's not the most expensive cut. It's a cut that really benefits from being cooked nice and slowly. So, we're just going to turn on our heat here. What this you is got in the pot? important here. In this pot, I've just got water. And that's what's magical about these dishes. We're going to transform that into a wonderful broth. So, is that water cold or cold? Hot? We want to extract the flavour of the beef yeah. and everything that we're going to put in as it comes up to that wonderful simmer. Yeah. So, just give my hands a quick wipe Can you there. imagine all this on a yacht? I know. Uh, you know, in a, yeah. in, in a regatta. Now, I mean, most, I'm a yachty myself, and we don't get much further than cocoa. I mean, imagine what would happen if you fell overboard. You'd sink like a stone, wouldn't you? <laughs> so, you, now, what's that you brought right. in there? So, we've got our red wine vinegar, water, and our silver cider beef yeah. seasoned. We're now going to take our buki garni. Yeah. What you want to do is just do that, OK? What, well, to bruise so, them? To bruise them, which yeah. releases the oils out of the herbs, OK? Oh, yeah. So, we're going to pop that in there like so. That's flavour. Next, juniper berries, OK? Right. right. We're just going to crack them, and it's quite a lot of juniper in this in this recipe. Because that's, that's quite a powerful taste. Quite it? a powerful taste. If you yeah. just have a smell in there now, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you instantly I've get been... that, that gin smell. They've yeah. been dried, so the flavour's really nice and intense. Again, in we go, like so. Next, Good. beautiful quality smoked bacon. Mm. Just mm. delicious. Mm. I mean, you just get that lovely smokiness. Yeah, it's the smokiness that really gives it the flavour, isn't it? Right the way around, like yep. so. Lid on. Yeah. That will come up. Now, don't boil. So, so where a the gentle simmer gentle where the bubbles simmer. are just breaking. No Absolutely. More. Yeah. Once you get to there, about every 10 minutes, just take the lid off and with a spoon, just move everything around the pot and just turn your beef like that. The temperature is going to travel up and down the beef as you keep turning it. There's something about beef and the sea, isn't there? The Navy's got this thing about yeah. roast beef. You know, they, they sailed Nelson and everything with beef in, in, in great casts, didn't they? Salt beef and yeah. salt pork. And there's that patriotic ballad, isn't there? The roast beef of old England. But it's still sung at naval uh, mess dinners, I think. You just touched on something there, that this recipe, actually, the beef was pickled. 
back oh. in the day. And the yeah. reason it was pickled was we didn't have refrigeration. No, 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 they so preserved it in these casts, yeah. yeah. For me, it actually is better doing yeah. it how we're doing it. Yeah. The, the, the acidity is a bit too kind of aggressive yeah. on the outside, and yeah. I don't like the texture it gives. No. But you've got vinegar in there, so yeah, to a got certain the extent you've... Uh, we've got that lovely, lovely acidity. You've got the idea there. So we're just chopping our parsley here. Leave the stalk on as well. It's a proper stew, all right? We don't need to be picking <laughs> it away all in, and all eh? of that. Right. After an hour and a half, yeah. that should be ready. Yeah. The best way to tell is take a knife like this, go right into the middle. If, if basically, if that knife goes through nice and easy, yeah. almost like butter, yeah. goes right the way through, that beef is beautifully cooked. So this was lunch on the Royal Yacht Britannia, which was that wonderful sailing boat of yeah. George V. Because when we talk about the Royal Yacht Britannia, we think of the, the Queen's vessel, yes. you know, that was launched in 54, just after the coronation, uh, and, you know, went out of royal service in 97. And the Queen went everywhere, if you remember. They did a million miles. A million miles. A million miles. How many times to the moon and back, is it? Yes, yeah. And how many times do they have beef derby? How's it looking? Yeah, it's looking delicious. When you've got to the hour and a half stage, we're going to add these beautiful turnips and carrots. Absolutely delicious. They go in, put them all round the pot, lid back on, and then you know the beef is cooked. The beef's not going to overcook in the time it's going to take to cook those. Yeah. I want those vegetables to be soft because yeah. when they're soft, they've like literally absorbed all that stock. <laughs> and then you're ready. <laughs> and as you can see, oh yeah, everything is just. And the, do you know the most important thing about this dish now is once the vegetables are ready, take it off and go walk the dogs. Does it need to rest? Just, just the same needs as a to roaster. Rest and then everything just kind of like settles. All that beef and everything just kind of like just gets even more flavoursome. Yeah, yeah. So a good rest with the lid on. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to finish with that parsley yeah. we've chopped. Probably okay. a good thing to have on a boat if you're racing and all that yeah. kind of stuff because you don't quite know when it is you're probably serving it. So we're just going to just put a bit of uh, just a bit a, more vinegar in. Didn't yeah, you? and I'm just yeah. going to literally move that around. Can you see all the vegetables? Yeah. And it's just it is beautiful. Right. It now, is a it's it's more of a peasant dish, don't you it think, is. than a than it, a than a than a royal you're dish? You're absolutely in a sense? right. It really is. It's that real peasant hearty food. Yeah. yeah. If I put that there. Thank you very much, Michael. Gosh, so, it looks good. It looks delicious, it doesn't does, it? It does, doesn't it? Right, I'm going to carve some slices. If you can just go in there and get some carrots yep. and some beautiful broth. OK. And right some up. lovely turnips. I'll do that. All right. How much broth do you want? Just a little bit. Just a little bit on, on the bottom. That <laughs> carrots are marvellous, aren't they? They're a lovely colour. Now, these baby turnips are a particular favourite of mine. That's plenty. Is that enough? That in itself is gorgeous, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And so if you just pop oh, that there... Smell that. It's lovely, isn't it? Go on, have a sniff. And do you know what's fantastic? Is that that was water. Yeah, That's yeah. what I love yeah. about it so much. There we go. We just... Like that. Just on top. There is just the faintest trace of pink just in there. Just a little bit, OK? It's not kind of boiled to death, is it? No, it's not. Now, important, there's a little bit of rock salt over yeah, like so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK? Yeah. And we take it a little bit more. Just of that parsley on the top. Yeah. Just on the top, I might say. Oh, that looks good. <laughs> Derby beef. Derby beef. Here we go. There's yours. You now first. You, now you first this time. Me first this yeah, time. Okay, yeah. I'm, yeah. All really the hard like... work you put into this. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Now, isn't that funny? You go for the carrot first. Mm. I wanted to taste that broth. That vinegar is so important. Mm. It's absolutely delicious. Mm. You can taste the beefiness that's gone through that broth. Mm. Taste the beefiness in the beef. Yeah. This is just the kind of hearty stuff you'd want on a boat if you've been sailing all morning. Definitely. Wouldn't it? Well, King George V, he so loved that boat, he so loved the sea. I really hope he enjoyed, yeah. he enjoyed that day because, I mean, it's sad when you think about it. Within a year, he was dead. Within a year, that beautiful yacht had been scuttled off the Isle of Wight. So this is really a dish that was at the end of an era. It's been a decade or so since Prince Charles called time on his sporting career, during which he'd sustained a few serious polo injuries. Royal chef Carolyn Robb, who worked for the Prince and Princess of Wales for 13 years, recalls how food revived his spirits after one mishap. Today I'm making one of my favourite dishes. It's poached egg served on crushed baby new potatoes. 
with baby spinach, crispy bacon, and a lovely fresh basil pesto sauce. This dish to me represents um, real comfort food and I remember very fondly one occasion when I made it. Prince Charles had unfortunately broken his arm playing polo and although he no longer had the use of his right hand, he still took the time and trouble to write a note to me saying thank you and telling me how much he'd enjoyed it and it was a, a wonderful note that I still treasure today because it was written with his left hand, which I thought was just incredible. Carolyn's boiled her potatoes for five minutes. Now I'm going to crush these and mix them with the butter and seasoning and herbs. I like to be quite generous with the butter. Pop that in. And a few twists of freshly ground black pepper. And a little bit of salt. And lastly, just a dash of cream. And nutmeg. You can buy ground nutmeg, obviously, but I always think that using whole nutmegs and grating them freshly, the taste is even better. Should do. I'm just going to crush these now so that they can still be formed into the, a little potato cake. Last thing I'm going to do now is add in the fresh herbs. That will give them a lovely colour and lovely flavour. Now, those are ready to use, and then just before we need them, I'll reheat them. Eggs were often on the menu at Highgrove. There were some wonderful chickens, so we had the most amazing eggs that were freshly picked up every day. It's quite an art to poaching eggs. The water should be simmering, but it shouldn't be boiling fast. I'm going to stir it round and round so we have like a little whirlpool and then pour the egg right into the centre and that should help to keep it together and then we hope for the best. <laughs> now I'm going to cook the crispy bacon for the topping. Uh, you can either use really thinly sliced streaky bacon or pancetta. Um, today I've got some pancetta. So a little bit of olive oil in the pan and then I'm just going to leave that to heat. And it'll only take a couple of moments to cook this. Carolyn poaches the egg for precisely one minute before placing it in a bowl of hot water to keep it warm. Once the pancetta is crispy, she boils some cream for the sauce and is ready to plate up. So first of all, I'm going to put the potato at the bottom. I've got a nice ring mould to shape it into that. If you don't have a ring mould, it doesn't matter at all. You can also just have a free-form potato cake. So there's that lovely creamy potato. And the next thing to do is to pop some baby spinach leaves on. Uh, you can use baby spinach or you could use rocket. It's lovely just to have a little bit of extra green on here. So using a draining spoon, take it out of the hot water and have a piece of kitchen paper ready just to get any excess water off the egg before we pop it on top of the spinach. I've got the hot cream here and I'm just going to, into this, I'm just going to mix a few spoons of pesto so we have a lovely bright green sauce to go over the top of the egg. Just going to mix that in. Being a chef in, a, in the royal household and, and working in a royal kitchen, you're never lonely, never short of someone to talk to, because they were very much the centre of the house and there was always somebody popping in for a chat and a cup of tea. The kettle was always warm in the kitchen. <laughs> and then the last finishing touch to this dish is a couple of pieces of this gorgeous crispy pancetta, which I'm just going to delicately pop across the top. So a few fresh herbs and a few shavings of fresh parmesan to add the final finishing touch. Simple, homely, comforting. Royal or not, this is a Premier League pick-me-up. A love of sports and the outdoor life is something Prince Charles shares with most of today's royals. 
but the Windsor's adventurous streak is somewhat tame in comparison to the escapades of their forebears. There was a famous incident, I, I just can't believe it, there's a famous incident sometime in the 1860s, I think, where Edward VII, he was Prince of Wales then, of course, yeah. actually chased a deer through central London. <laughs> yeah, started in Harrow somewhere yeah. and ended up in the goods yard at Paddington Station. <laughs> I don't think you see many deers in London now. I don't Hence think you the do. attraction of Balmoral. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Queen is famously fond of Balmoral and she loves to attend the Highland Games when she's in residence. Toasting sporting success with a wee dram has always been part and parcel of the occasion. And just a stone's throw from Balmoral Loch Nagar whisky has a long association with the royal family. Anna Ha caught up with the distillery's Claire Fraser to find out more. When was this distillery built? So this distillery was built in 1845 by a man called John Begg. Now he built the distillery here and then three years later Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were up on holiday. Oh, they were house hunting. I so see. John Begg wrote a letter to her private secretary inviting them up. So they came up to the distillery, they had the very first documented whisky distillery tour and then they tasted the fine spirit as well. At the time, Victoria and Albert were leasing Balmoral Castle. It was a canny move by the entrepreneurial John Begg to invite the royal couple for a wee dram. The distillery was soon supplying whisky to the regal household and the word royal was swiftly added to its name. So I heard Queen Victoria loved her whisky. Yeah, she used to put claret in her whisky. Oh, God, no. <laughs> and she took it on all of her picnics with her. Well, I heard she actually liked to put whisky in her tea. Well, I don't know about in her tea, but she certainly used to mix it with claret. <laughs> Over a century and a half on, things are still done in a very traditional way here. The distillery manager is Sean Phillips. Is the uh, whisky production the same as it was in Queen Victoria's time? Yes, it is, because we only use three ingredients, which was used back then and are still used today. So we've got the good old Scottish water. <laughs> we have got our malted barley. Mm. And we have got our yeast. So can I make it myself? Yes, you probably could, <laughs> but um, it might not be a good idea. <laughs> Perhaps best if Sean shows Anna how it's done. First, the barley is ground and mixed with hot water, a process known as mashing. And what the mash sun is doing is we're taking all the sugars out. Of, that will be going through to the wash vat where it will be starting to ferment. The sugary liquid is then siphoned through a series of pipes into a huge barrel, where yeast is then added and fermentation begins. You can now see oh, yeah. it fermenting, yeah. and you can start to see the froth yeah, starting to appear yeah. on there. What's formed is a simple beer. To turn it into spirit requires distillation. Oh, wow! These are huge! The beer-like liquid is boiled in these vast copper vessels and the vapour condensed. This removes water and increases the alcohol content. OK, move on to the next one before a final stage of distillation to refine its strength and flavour. You can still really smell still it, like really it's quite smell, a strong still, smell. Still quite can strong. I get drunk on this, or...? Not at this point, <laughs> unless, you, unless you drink it. So you, <laughs> how, you how do I get in there? No, it's all locked away. You knew where I was going. <laughs> Maybe that's why this part of distillation is carried out in what's called a spirit safe. A whisky fit for a queen shouldn't be rushed. For the final stage, the spirit is placed in wooden casks and left for a number of years. So this is my one of my favourite places on the distillery. We have got around about 40 casks maturing. This one is a 1986. Wow. So what we're going to do, we're going to yep. taste from here. Is it ready? And release. Cool! Would you hire me? I would hire you. That is absolutely delicious. It is, yep, you can get that, pick that up on the, on the front. Victoria and Albert may have been the royals who first discovered the distillery, but today's queen has also sampled the whisky here, including a very special blend created to celebrate 60 years of her reign. 
The whisky that went into these casks was from 1952. And there was 60 whiskies used from uh, distilleries all around Scotland. We bottled 60 bottles for the Diamond Jubilee. And we gave one bottle to the Queen. Just one? Just the one. And 59 bottles were all sold for £100,000 <gasps> each. Uh, oh my goodness! For a scholarship trust. £100,000 for one bottle of whiskey? One bottle of whiskey, yes. That's wonderful. Which, uh, which one am I trying next? <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Many of the royals are not only avid sportsmen and women, they're also keen spectators and great patrons. And when it comes to matters of national sporting pride, the last thing they'll do is skimp on pudding. Now, this is not just a royal dish, no. but this has got sporting history. This was served up. There was a very special royal banquet in 2005. Do you remember? London was pitching for the Olympic Games. Yes. And the remember Queen well. threw a state banquet for the uh, Olympic Committee. And they were treated like heads of state. Uh, they came through the quadrangle at Buckingham Palace, the Yeomen of the Guard were there, the Coldstream Guard String Quartet, and they had a full-scale royal banquet. Right. Worked. And this Absolutely. was the pudding. Yeah, it did. Caramelised pear tart. So, how did they make this? Do you like things like Bakewell tart? Ooh, right, yes. Right, OK, yeah. so what I'm making here is frangipan. We substitute the flour yeah. for ground almonds. Oh. So, so far in here, we've got butter and sugar. Before we add the ground almonds, we're going to take one egg. Yep. Basic to loosen the mix, yeah. and when it so when it cooks, it's going to set nicely. Yeah. At the banquet, it may have been done sort of like a tart fiend, which is like puff pastry, really thin, baked between two sheets, a little bit of frangipan, and then basically sliced pears all the way around, and then glazed with apricot That's jam. That's the French way. Eh? French way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tart fiend. Mm. What we're going to do, proper British way, yeah. we're going to do a deep fill. <laughs> okay, right, so we're... Actually, we don't know which way they did it, but my guess is we did it the British way because what's really interesting about this banquet, because you've got to remember that the other big competitor for the stage in the Olympics in 2012 was Paris. So when you look at the banquet menu, not even the wines are French, the wines are from New Zealand, Australia uh, and Portugal. So they were avoiding any reference to France yeah. because Paris was a big competitor, so I reckon they did it your way. What next? So we've creamed our butter and sugar, mm -hmm. we've added our one egg, we've folded in our ground almonds and we've made that. Just smell that mix. Oh, yeah. What, oh, OK, yes. yep. now we've got one more ingredient to go in there. It's just going to give it that bit of oomph. Yeah. Pear brandy. <laughs> Is it nice? <laughs> yeah. Would you like me to pour your slurp? Mm. Yes. Okay. Well, if you insist, Paul, yeah. What about yourself? I'm good. I'm good. I've got a focus. I'm not just standing there talking about history. I've, <laughs> got, I've got to cook. Come on, get on with it. <laughs> oh, that's lovely, isn't it? You can smell the pears. It's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You've gone all red. <laughs> no, not, not at all, Paul. Just carry on. Carry on. Keep cooking. OK. <laughs> Mm. OK, so over here we've got a um, blind-baked pastry case. What does that mean? And that means we've filled it with baking beans and then we've put it into the oven and we've cooked it so the actual pastry case now is cooked like a biscuit. So now we go in with this wonderful Gosh, that mixture. Looks good, doesn't it? What beautiful colours there It's are. absolutely stunning. And the flavour of it, just pears, almonds, they all go together. Now... No, yeah, you... don't waste any. No, I'm not going to waste any at all. Right, now, if you just spread that, hold the case there and just right. spread that to the outside, I'm going to make a start on the pears. OK. It's okay. a bit of a responsibility, this, you know. <laughs> no, I'm... Have Michael, we got enough of I've this? I've got every faith in you. <laughs> we're just going to take our pears and we're going to top and tail them. What I've got here is the William variety. So, really juicy and it's a great pear for cooking with. They're beautiful pears, they are. actually, aren't they? They're absolutely just glistening. Get... Now, no, how are you going to get rid of the... Core. We couldn't have picked a worse thing. This is actually called a Parisian scoop. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but today it's a Cora. It's a Cora. <laughs> it's a Cora. It's almost like doing an ice cream corner, isn't it? Absolutely. So we're just going to remove that like so. That's very neat. Do you know what? I'm glad you picked up on that because it's all these little processes. It's such a simple dish. Yeah. It's a pastry case, frangipan in there. But take your time with everything and just love what you're doing. 
Okay, ready? Yep. Oh, I love the way you do this. So now, I'm going to put those into the lemon juice. Okay. What's the purpose of the lemon juice? Now, the lemon juice is doing two things. The acidity is stopping the pears going brown, but also pear, lemon, yeah. almonds, they yeah. all go. They're best friends. Yeah, yeah. All right. So if you just take the slices, and literally, we're going to start from the outside. You've done such a wonderful job here, Michael. That's very kind of There's you, There's a plate, all right? Yeah, and I you're really just appreciate go, that coming from we're you. We're just going to go round like so, and just overlap like that, mm -hmm. OK? And I'll continue to this slice the This is a bit of a pears. long job, this, you know. Brilliant end to a meal, isn't it? I can hear the Coldstream Guard string quartet playing for these Olympic committee men and women. Do you want to know what else they had? I do. They started with sea bass, then breast of duck, and halal chicken for the Muslim guests. Yeah. And then the caramelised pear tart. I mean, not a, not a huge banquet by royal uh, standards, but I suppose the kind of royal banquet that you get these days, which is pared down, so to speak. Joke. You're just too good. I am. Um, right, ready? Uh, OK, well, I'm, right, I'm going to help you. I need help. Absolutely brilliant, no. I'm not just saying that. Absolutely fantastic. Mm. And just overlapping them like right round. There so, we go. Pears have gone all the way around, overlapping. Now, how like thick so. should this be? Is that is that kind of thick? No, enough? we just want one layer. So you're just going to go one layer of pears over the top. So if you could just now take that mm. to the oven, mm. I'm going to place it in at your favourite temperature, which 180. is 180. Got well you. done. I'm ahead of you. You are ahead of me for 30 minutes. 30 minutes. All right. Uh, Okey doke. The lemon with the pear, by the way, is it works, doesn't it? it? Yeah, really it's works. not just for the browning purposes. No. Right. Now, what are you up to? We've got some apricot jam. We're going to add some more of this pear oh, I think brandy. That's a good idea. Bring it up to the heat, like yeah. so. And you're doing this with, with a brush? Yeah, just with a brush, because this is what we're going to brush all over yeah. our finished tart. Does look good. The taste of the apricot isn't going to overwhelm. No, it isn't. You'll see when you get it's just a thin glaze on the top, and it just gives it that real nice yeah. shine. Could you bring the I'll plate over, please? Yep. OK. Well, I put it here. Right. Now. Go on, you do it. No, no, you do it. OK. Whoa. That is something special, that isn't is it? That is terrific, isn't it? It was Absolutely. worth going to all that trouble layering the pear around there. Oh, so now, right. yep. this lovely apricot jam, it's yep. got that lovely pear brandy yep. in there. Yep. We're just going to now brush it I mean, over. it's already shiny. Yeah. Gosh, that looks good. And just see how it goes on the pastry. It just looks like a beautiful pastry shop dessert, doesn't it? Yeah. So we just glaze that all over like so. Also helps keep that pastry on the edge there nice and crispy. You up for this? I am, I am, <laughs> I am. Just going to take a beautiful... Is a rule of thumb for how large a segment you normally cut? Not, no, just when no. I'm in company like yours, generosity. <laughs> That's look, the keynote. Look at that. Oh, Beautiful yeah. crisp pastry, frangipan, nice and moist. Yep. Those lovely glazed pears on top. Wow. Now, coming up from Cornwall, there's only one thing to have with this, Michael, all right? And that is clotted cream. Look at that. Look oh, at it crisping. Oh, look at it. <laughs> and for me, we're just going to make it snow. <laughs> You've got put everything into this, haven't you? Do you yes. know what I love the most? See the way that clotted cream just melting on the warm for the tart. <laughs> right. Yeah, come on. Let's Your tools? Some, let's not just look at it. Let's try it. After you. No, after you. Sure, excellent. I'm going to have some of your uh, Devon cream. <laughs> oh, you're going to be in trouble. Oh, low blow, are. eh? Low blow. <laughs> oh. Mmm. Uh. Look at that. Mmm. Oh, the frangipan. Wow, it's wonderful. Mmm, pear. They... It's, it has everything. You've got the texture yep. from the pastry, mm. the frangipan. You get that. You even get that, the lovely lemon coming off the pears. Yep. Everything. That is stunning. We don't know for sure, but you and I know. That's what clinched it. I think if London. I had been there and I'd cooked that, yep. we would have known a lot sooner. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we would have done the Olympic Games four years earlier. <laughs> well, there you are. Caramelised pear tart. A gold medal winner if ever I saw one. <laughs> Join us next time.